Hello everyone. Welcome to the presentations of the design competition. Um, I'm Harpo Othart from the Embassy of the North Sea. I'll be your guide, uh, time management. Um, and I'll uh, we'll start by giving the floor to Peter Paul van Beek. Um, Peter Paul, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harpo. Yes, um, let me uh, extend a warm word of welcome to uh, everyone to start this uh, exciting uh, meeting. It's actually, I think, exciting for anyone <laughs> present in the room. Uh, a warm welcome uh, to, the, to the jury, to all students who are also participating, the ambassadors uh, of the contest, uh, some of whom are, are online now, some of whom might uh, watch this later, and of course, the other people in the audience. The Design Challenge uh, Give a Voice to the North Sea is a joint initiative uh, by the Inter International Spinoza Prize Foundation on the one hand, the Embassy of the North Sea on the other hand, and the Design Lab and Philosophy Lab of the University of Twente on the third hand. <laughs> so together we have been working quite hard to connect a design contest to the awarding of the Spinoza Lens Prize to Latour, Gunne Latour on November 24 in Felix Meritis, uh, or at least digitally probably in Felix Meritis and also online uh, on that day. Latour uh, as the winner of an important prize for philosophers who are not only excellent philosophers that innovate philosophy, but that also bring philosophy to society and that, uh, well, innovate society with their ideas. The special thing is that the Embassy of the North Sea is working in the tradition of Latour, is working with the ambition to uh, give a voice to the, the non-human uh, uh, inhabitants of this world as well, and not only to the humans. So the contest was actually to develop uh, an instrument or a method in the spirit of Latour, and uh, well, a way to make visible the role of the non-humans in our society. And that design should then somehow link uh, technology, uh, uh, humans and non-humans to our society. That's what the contest was. Uh, in three different subdomains, it will all be explained to you later. Uh, but what we will see here today is actually a selection already of people who uh, uh, well, have indicated that they would like to take part in the contest. Nine teams of students will demonstrate their ideas and we will select uh, uh, three winners in three categories. So we really uh, look forward to, to that. And of course, also then there will be a winner of the winners, <laughs> a winner of the three finalists. And that winner will be announced uh, on November 6 uh, at uh, one of the, the, the days of the conference that we are organizing in Twente, digital conference, uh, the philosophy of human technology relations from November 4 to November 7, November 6 in the afternoon at a quarter to three, uh, there will be a ceremony to award uh, well, the prize to the winner of the three winners that we will select today. That's a bit of an overview. Again, a warm word of welcome to everyone. Uh, and I would now like to give the word to Daan Rovers, who will uh, introduce the jury and chair the jury. Daan. Um, for your introduction, I'm going to introduce the jury, but uh, I'd like to have them introduced by themselves because uh, uh, they can. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to have this uh, job of chairing the jury. Uh, and we have uh, different F experts with different backgrounds and different pers perspectives on this question and on Latour. So I'd like them to introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with um, Huub Dijsselbloem. Well, thank you very much. My name is Huub Dijsselbloem. I'm professor of philosophy of science and politics at the University of Amsterdam and researcher at the Dutch Scientific Council for Government Policy. Um, I was a student of Latour once myself, so I'm properly indoctrinated. Um, and to measure the philosophical content uh, of your presentations, I brought a specific tool, maybe you can see it, to measure the amount of philosophy in your presentation. I look forward to it. Thank you, Huub. This is also a short exercise in the technique, so uh, you all have to press your spacebar. Uh, let's now give the word to Anton van der Velde. Oh, I hope you can hear me. I'm uh, Ton van der Velde from uh, Institute of Philosophy in Leuven. I've been teaching uh, social and political philosophy. I'm an economist and a philosopher, and um, uh, currently I'm teaching social ethics and uh, ethics and public policy. 
Latour is um, yes, is a French philosopher and uh, he is well known in the Anglo-Saxon and the continental philosophy. And at Leuven, we mainly do continental philosophy, but um, well, this is the most inspiring person. And I yesterday I got gets a honorific doctorate at the University of Leuven in February 2021. So that's the good news. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Uh, let's uh, ask Louise Schouwenberg to introduce herself. Yes, I'm Louise Schouwenberg. I'm head of uh, one of the five master departments of Design Academy Eindhoven. And um, about Latour, I know um, enough uh, to speak today maybe with you, but uh, uh, I, I was a, a philosophy student. Um, but my background is visual art. Okay. Thank you, Louise. Yes, art is an uh, important uh, perspective as well this afternoon, this morning. Uh, Peter Paul. You have already introduced yourself, but please do it again in one sentence as a member <laughs> of the jury. Sorry that I didn't even properly say who I am. A philosopher of technology working at the University of Twente and also co-director of the Design Lab that is uh, co-hosting uh, this contest. Thank you. And I am uh, Daan Rovers. I'm a philosopher. I'm a thinker laureate at the moment. And I am a member of the board of the Spinoza Committee who uh, organizes this uh, election and this uh, um, election of Latour as a laureate. Um, well, I think we've had our jury members. Harpo, can I give the word to you again? Of course. Thank you very much, members of the jury. Um, I'll also quickly introduce myself. I am Harpo at heart, um, one of the board members of the Embassy of the North Sea. And my field of expertise is actually um, the arts. Um, I, could we put the uh, video on me, Jose? Um, I would um, quickly talk you through the three cases. So we will have presentations of the first case, which is a voice for the eel. The second one is about underwater noise. And the third about the future of the delta. And we're very happy to listen to your proposals to also give more depth and more uh, uh, perspectives on the cases that we are researching at the moment. Um, so I'll talk you to the planning of the day. So we'll start with the, th with the three pitches of the eel, and then we have a lunch break and the jury will deliberate. Um, so the question is to keep your uh, microphones muted and also your video when you're not presenting. Um, so we'll start with a quick with the video and then afterwards the, the student in question is asked to put on their video and their microphone in order to speak to the jury in a short Q&A and they will get two questions and the Q&As will be led by Dan. So directly after the video, Dan will take over and she will lead the Q&A. Um, did I miss something practical? I don't think so. Um, so we'll start with the first presentation um, by Daniel Garcia. Um, it's called What Humans Call North. Um, Daniel, um, are you ready to put on your mic and video after the after the short pitch? Yes, I am. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Nice to have you here. So um, let's start with your video. Long, long time ago. You humans used to walk very long distances during long days and long nights. The sun would guide you in the day and the stars would guide you in the night. 
but day and night, something inside of you would tell you where to go. Just like pigeons or eels. Now imagine something in your body could tell you where to go. Please look to your left. Did you feel that? That's what you humans call north. Now look to your right. Yes, that's south. Walk two steps to the front. You are still facing east. Now turn right and walk two steps. Then turn right again and walk two more steps. You are now facing west. Now please turn right again. You are now aligned with the earth magnetic field. Don't move. Feel it. If you walk two steps to the front and turn your body to the right, you will be back in your initial position. Do it. It's easy. Two steps to the front, then turn right. Now close your eyes and imagine yourself as a baby. Imagine yourself in your mother's womb, floating. When you hear the crying of a baby, you will be born. One, two, three. Don't open your eyes yet. Observe the room and the people around you. At the count of three, answer the question out loud. One, two, three. Where are you? I couldn't hear you. Please say it louder. Thank you. Now when I say the words, enjoy the journey and count to three. You will start walking to the place you were born. You will walk slowly four steps in the direction of that place. When you are down, you will be able to open your eyes and see where you are standing. You are still facing east. Enjoy the journey. One, two, three. What you just have seen is the interaction with an installation that speculates with giving geomagnetic sensitivity to humans. It does it with the help of a very accessible and affordable technology that will be shared as open source so everyone can use it. I'm talking about a power bank, an Arduino with a compass sensor and a tiny vibration disc. When visitors have the helmet on, they will feel and hear a slight vibration in their heads when they turn to either north or south. Next to this, headphones attached to the helmet will allow the visitors to listen to this mysterious voice that is guiding and challenging them at the same time. At this point, you might wonder, but why? Well, this project tries to answer a question. What do we have in common with eels? Eels have a very well-documented magnetic sensitivity that enhances their sense of direction. Thanks to this, they can cross the Atlantic Ocean when they are born and once more, much later, when they go back to their birthplace to lay their eggs and then die. 
However, in modern humans, this skill has been diminished along the thousands of years of our evolution. Bruno Latour points out that animals, oceans, and rivers have become objects and spaces used as mere receptacles for human categories. So we need new categories. In this situation of urgent crisis that we are all living, the question that this project is asking is, can eels still show us the way back to the experience of Earth as a familiar place, to the experience of what Latour calls Gaia? Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Garcia, for your presentation. Um, I will give uh, one or two members of the jury the opportunity to pose a question. Maybe um, Louise, do you want to pose a question to Daniel? Uh, yes, uh, Daniel, I looked up your profile page and it says that you have a human-centered approach to design. Uh, now my question is, was it very difficult to embrace Latour's suggestion of being on an equal footing with the other species and even objects. How did that work? Was this a very different um, assignment for you? Yes, uh, yes it was indeed, because uh, the idea is to translate uh, something that is mysterious, that we, we don't know much about it, even we don't really know. We want to preserve it as a mystery, as uh, it was in the, in the assignment. And uh, we had to translate it to, to human experience. So um, in the beginning, for example, I thought we could translate the sense of direction uh, in a very subtle way as um, temperature. You could feel warm or, or cold in your, in your body, depending if you were looking north or south. So uh, I had to, to think about a way to translate this uh, mysterious uh, way of feeling direction that non-humans have to a human body. In this sense, it was challenging, yes. And I have maybe an addition to yet. You, you uh, talk about we. Uh, were you in a team? In the description, it says only your name, but were you with the team? Uh, no, I was on my own. I did uh, collaborate with the design lab in Twente, so they, they, they were very helpful with the technical part uh, to work with the Arduino, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Peter Thanks. Paul. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. So, awesome presentation. Very nice movie. I was wondering to what extent your design could also help us uh, understand the problems that uh, the eel uh, are facing, the disturbance of the magnetic fields or the challenges that uh, we are forming for their ways of living their lives. Yeah. <laughs> In this sense, I think the, um, the, the installation is, uh, is political uh, in a way that is trying to, uh, to encourage a new sensitivity, um, a new sensibility and uh, new categories, but it's not addressing specifically uh, solutions or infrastructures that we could uh, implement to to help the eel so at this stage the the installation is more uh, is more trying to um, to stay with the trouble to to go deeper in the problem before we we start thinking about solutions because I myself I I couldn't even uh, think about uh, solutions or more technical uh, infrastructures. So in this sense, uh, I think it, it was important to stop first, reflect, and try to, to check the ground of the visitor, try to make a very short, but still transformative experience. So visitors, they, they can have access to, to a non-human experience, so they can start imagining a different uh, sensib sensibility that is not human. Can we have, thank you, uh, Daniel. Can we have one Thanks. other question, Harpo? We are actually ahead of time, so yes. <laughs> okay, then uh, uh, Anton uh, wants to pose a question. Uh, I'm wondering, Daniel, so thank you for your presentation. It was, uh, it was very, very inspiring. You could, you could, maybe you want to say something about human beings and not just about the eels. And do you, 
suggest that human beings have something in common with eels in the sense of, for instance, the search for paradise and the return to an origin and the origin here is place of birth and the, the eel has a kind of nice cycle in his uh, life and life is uh, being underway apparently. Is, do you mean something in this respect? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Thanks. Um, so uh, I think in, in thinking uh, about things that connect us with, with the eel, so uh, of course, uh, giving birth, dying, uh, traveling, these were very uh, essential, important concepts that I thought that they, they could resonate with any visitor or with, uh, with any person and are also non-human experiences, are also things that, that they will go through. And, um, and moreover, also, I was, I was thinking about the, how do we move in the space? So uh, it's, not the, it's not the same walking around the city following Google Maps, for example, that is you're receiving just a visual input. So you get the feeling you can even dominate the, the territory. You can conquer it with your eyes than actually feel the direction in your body. That is as a, as a non-human would do it for many non-humans. So in this sense, uh, I also wanted to, yeah, to to force the visitor to to find these things in common and find things that maybe we used to have in common, but we don't have it anymore. Thank you, Daniel. Um, please stay with us if we um, uh, invite the other two uh, uh, contestants for this uh, category. Uh, you can join us and then I pass the word to Harpo to introduce the second design. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, members of the jury. Um, thank you for helping us representing the eel in, uh, in uh, ways that we can reimagine what it's like to be an eel. Um, now I would like to announce the next pitch by Lara Lane. Um, a voice for the eel, where narratives collide, the European eel in environmental politics. Um, well, we know what's going to happen. We start with the video and then there's again the Q&A. We are a bit ahead of time, which is nice. So we could also have three questions more. So please, the video for Lara Lane. Hi, I'm Lara and I'm going to present my a project on representing the voice of the European eel in uh, politics. So um, my project is kind of like a visual essay or discussion that tries to lay bare the differing realities around the European eel and its own voice in human politics in three different visual frames. Um, the whole piece is around 15 minutes long and I imagine it being projected onto a wall so that the different visual frames that are now three different movies can cut across another more smoothly than now on my laptop. Um, so when you also now, for example, see a white screen, um, you won't see it like that when you project it onto a wall. If it's white, you just won't see it. But yeah, to the project. Um, in total, the eel story narrated by a poetic voice accompanying an animation of a swimming eel, as you can see in the bottom, will be complemented and overshadowed with fragments about centuries of mystery around the creature, um, to the history of eel fishery, to more recent mass farming, human impacts on the eel through water management, as well as the growing awareness of the eel going extinct and scientific findings about its vulnerabilities and needs, etc. So there will be a bit of a historic linearity to the piece. Um, so I'm gonna introduce those different frames now a bit more. Um, the first one is um, the one that is supposed to represent the eel as a being itself, so its own voice, and that's the one in the bottom. Um, the eel is represented in a more abstract and aesthetic and poetic way, and it's telling the life story of its species and at the same time what it needs, its need for free movement, its resemblance with the element of water itself as a fluid and transformative being. Um, I will give a short insight into the piece here from, um, so that you can just see how the first frame works. Um, 
Already in the state of Alave, my consciousness was the movement of the sea. From my moment of birth, I was destined to move with and transform the water surrounding me, like the minerals, like the plankton, like each drop of water, I was merged with a magical element. Okay, now I'm gonna mute it and let, let it like leave it running so you can see a bit more of it, but without the tone, um, so I can explain more. So the storytelling as that you heard now um, is more, it's like kind of touching, aesthetic, poetic, and somehow dreamy to on the one hand represent the mystery and wonder around the ear from the human scientific perspective um, and to enable an emotional or empathic connecting of the viewer with the ear as a living being. Um, especially a creature that for many is either somehow slimy and repelling or merely seen as food or something. Um, so then there are two other visual frames that you can see on the top now and they're blinking right now. Um, and these two other frames respond to certain demands and realities of the ear expressed in the first frame. Um, so without stating clear arguments, which could on the one hand be seen as limiting and patronizing, I thought, and at the same time would make it boring for the viewer, I try to let the visuals speak for themselves and let arguments arise from the modes of representation. So the way the different visual frames respond to another and cut across another. Um, yeah, so that there's room for arguments to evolve by themselves, um, which hopefully will also keep the viewer more interested and engaged. Yeah, so the piece starts with giving some space to uh, first, first uh, let the eel in the first frame appear, tell its story and let the viewer engage with the animal itself. And then the other um, frames will stimulate some further interest in the big eel mystery and the eel question, um, its beauty of transformation, etc. And after that, the eel's narrative will be complemented with facts um, from the human world about the eel from a scientific perspective, as well as with facts about um, how the human world impacts the eel's life, such as environmental policy making, fishery and constructions of dams and turbines, like in the data plan of the Dutch government. I will present you one part of the piece now as an impression for how the firms work together. And I'm gonna skip through the piece a little bit. So here you can see, um, yeah, facts about fishery, fishing culture. Um, I'm gonna go here and play it for a little bit. We hit the wall and we hit the walls more and more of us. Monstrous turbines, noises so loud, vibrations so disturbing, and no food to feed them. No way home, no way to the waters of the land. I'm gonna let it run again and no. mute it. Um, so the eel in his story tells about its need to move and transform with the water and across habitats. And then the other visual frames show findings of the European eel going extinct because of anthropogenic interferences, hindering the flow of the water, as well as the planning of further dam constructions and the increasing demand for even more human induced water management and domination because of, for example, um, sea level rise and um, the problems it poses to, poses to human survival, for example. Um, so there will be the voice of the eel and its needs colliding with a human world, interfering in its life. But also there will be um, dissonances arising inside the human sphere. So in the second and third frame, there will be dissonances as well. Um, as for example, scientific voices and practical attempts at managing the ecological often don't work together and are not really connected. So I'm not putting clear stated arguments and rather let different narratives collide. So to not limit the scope of arguments to arise as well as so to not be ignorant to different stakeholders and needs as with the threat posed by sea level rise to humans and at the same time, the need of the ear to keep the threshold between water and land and the water flow in general open. So that's about it for my presentation. And yeah, I just skip to the end because 
It will be a bit sad showing the mass tanks in the end and empty water, but there's a hopeful view into an ear release by the Dupin Foundation in the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Lara. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I want to ask a question myself because um, can you please uh, relate your design or your framework uh, to the thinking of Latour or to do one of his concepts? Is that possible? Uh, yes, hi. <laughs> I'm in search school, if you can see that. Um, yeah, so my, I think my main point was trying to, I mean, of course, first represent the voice of someone we usually can't hear, but then also um, the conflict that uh, Latour writes about between um, science trying to be uh, neutral, working the, um, how do you say, the normative, like the objective. Um, but you can actually never, when you, as a scientist, um, try to not make an argument and stay neutral, then the people that make arguments against, for example, climate change or environmental um, policy making that is connected to the scientific finding, make like a scientific, or you make like an argument that um, goes against what you're finding out. So like if you, it doesn't make sense to in science not to make arguments and to not connect it to the practical. And when you look at um, the second and third frame, how they're colliding or how they don't work together, this problematic comes out of it. And I think the ear with its demands for what it needs um, kind of gives a voice to a, like an argument to the scientific statements that usually are just stated without any um, follow-ups. Bit difficult to explain, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> I want to give uh, the floor to Hub Dijsselbloem for a question, if you like to. Yes, thank you very much. That was wonderful, beautiful to see. Um, I really appreciate how you described the journey from the eel from being a mystery guests in a transformation process and becoming a political actor. My question is, do you think the eel only becomes a political actor when a problem arises, when it's threatened with extinction, an ecological problem comes up, or can the eel also be, be a political actor when there are no problems involved, when it's still a mystery guest? Mm. Um, I, huh, I mean, definitely, but I mean, when we talk about politics and how we interfere with the environment, I mean, we can always, it would always be nice to include the ecological, but I think the point is to not uh, be hurtful to the non-human and to emancipate them. So when we're confronting why it's important or like when when it's important to include that voice i guess it's usually when we would pose a problem to them somehow. if everything is okay and there's no problems then we would be in peace with the environment and act as ecological uh, agents dominating humans. yeah louisa you want to pose a question Yes, I, I would like to, uh, to know why did you choose a high-pitched female voice? Uh, was that a conscious choice? Maybe you told it because my connection is not totally good, but I, was there experimenting going ahead uh, of that with other voices? Yeah, uh, for me it was actually because it also a little bit sounds more like a like female and more childish voice is maybe more sympathizing for the viewer, but also I would always choose it, I think, because of the idea of um, fluidity and movement and transformation, which is also, and the, I mean, the male masculine is usually more the connected to the dominating and not so fluid and gentle. So it just made sense to me for the, for the animal. Okay. Thank you. Other members of the jury who want to, to yeah, ask please. something? If I may, uh, Dan. 
available. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Very uh, nice to hear. So indeed, uh, I was thinking along the same lines as Louise, you give a voice to the eel and it's a very specific voice <laughs> that you give it now. Um, at the end, um, actually, uh, I was not entirely sure what you wanted to say, but you wanted to give a hopeful end huh, where there is not an empty sea, but there is a lot of eel. <laughs> and um, could you explain a little bit about how you arrive at that end and what the political message of that is? Yeah, so the, I mean, the, because the whole um, clip is a bit more, has like a historic linearity to it. So it's, um, in the end, I want to, I do want to make the point and show people that we are, the, like, eel is basically, it's nearly extinct. And if we don't do something now, the water is empty. And there's nearly no fish in the sea anymore. And when you buy eel now, it comes from the mass tanks. So that's just like the reality in the end. But I don't want to end it there because there's still, I mean, that's the whole thing with, I mean, climate change or whatever. You could be like, yeah, we can't, I mean, we're doomed anyway, so let's not do anything, but you can always do something in the situation still, like with, um, yeah, like you can still try to make ear releases and um, repopulate and all this stuff. So it's, you can still, still do stuff. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Good. Tona, so are you raising your hand as well? So go ahead. It's so uh, thank you for this presentation. I learned that not just uh, Aphrodite was born out of sea foam, but also uh, Eus, according to the uh, ancient Greeks, are born from from sea foam. Um, Latour has this idea that um, nature, a kind of original, untouched nature, does not exist anymore and that we have to cope with reality of hybrids. And um, so in the end, you come to this, uh, this uh, I, di I didn't know anything about eels, but apparently there are eel farms. And uh, I suppose that they are mimicking the natural process in these farms. Is this what uh, you mean by showing this uh, or? Do you want to put into question this distinction between nature and then, let's say, humanly induced production? Um, I think this not really because uh, uh, the eel in tanks are usually glass eels. As far as I know, the glass eels are usually still have to be taken from the sea. So no one can still um, just reproduce eels by themselves. You can't actually really farm them. But I also really like that about the game because it keeps this like mystery and kind of this, um, how do you say, um, like authentic, no, I don't know. Um, but it's like, you can't really farm the ear. So it's always a product of stealing this fish from the sea basically. And I mean, and yeah, so in this, in this uh, case, I would rather say that you can still release them and you can still try to like, open up also like the a symbolic opening up of um, slashes and dams to let them um, move again, for example, like the release where it, it opens up, you know, like this, I like the image, but yeah, actually this one is not a good uh, example for the uh, culture and nature interwovenness, but yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Lara, for this pitch and for your answers. Uh, and please stay with us. And now we are going to introduce the third pitch, Harpo. Yes, thank you, Lara. Thank you, members of the jury. Um, just a bit of eel knowledge. It is indeed true that the eel cannot be farmed in the sense that they have to make the journey to the Sargasso Sea in order to be able to reproduce offspring. So, it, and this cannot be uh, uh, faked. This cannot be. Uh, me mechanically uh, uh, or chemically induced. Um, and indeed, it's something that emerges is that the voice for the eel seems to be a kid's voice. That is a very interesting thing that is happening at the moment that I really curious why this happened already twice. Um, so the next presentation is by Ivana Flip. Nothing is unknown to imagination is its name. Um, so Ivana, are you ready to answer the questions after your video? Yes, just a little correction is Ivana Philip. 
Oh shit! Uh, Excuse us. Uh, that's fine. Yes, if I'm not. Thank yes, you thank you. Much. If I also make mistakes in other names, please forgive and correct me. Thank you for that. Um, so, let's play the video. Hello and welcome to the Nothing is Unknown to Imagination. Nothing is Unknown to Imagination is a multimedia artwork designed to test and enhance human notion of interspecies interconnectedness through audio meditation and participatory sculpture. This project is a continuation of my artistic practice focused on the human-non-human relationships. To jump across all uncertainties about eel and to allow creativity to take off, I was confident that my previous experiences would not lead me astray. Key elements of this research are knowledge gaps, hypotheses, methods and data gathering. I asked myself, what do I know about eel? And I started with a hypothesis that I knew exactly what or enough I need to know and what eels want me to know. I used interspecies communication and writing as main methods and will gather data from audience participation. Key processes in the project are looking at eel closely, reflecting on Latour's philosophy, brainstorming and developing idea, implementing advice from the jury and completing the work with the help of eel and imagination. Closer look at eel, process one. I started by asking myself how to place myself in the mind of eel. The first thing I discovered in common is our life expectancy, between 80 and 85 years. That inspired me to look out for more similarities in our life cycles. I thought there must be more. My artistic approach is holistic. I read about eel in books and scientific articles about his or her physical qualities, I thought about their mental qualities such as resilience, awareness, or unknown. Spiritual notion wraps all together, accepting gracefully all known and unknown. These two images were the entering door into finding relations between eel and human life cycles. For example, glass eels are between one and six years young, which corresponds to human phase of infancy. Process 2. Reflection on Latour's philosophy. Actor network theory influenced my previous artistic practice and here I will share a few of Latour's quotes. But I'm not a philosopher, neither a scientist, so I use it as an artist, so please allow me some freedom to find a compassionate and gentle way to meet with the other. Latour asks... What sort of agency earth, and I said eel, should be granted? To be a subject is not to act autonomously in front of an objective background, but to share agency with other subjects that have also lost their autonomy. The point of living in the epoch of the Anthropocene is that all agents share the same shape-changing destiny. Also, Newton had to think of an agent able to transport action at a distance instantaneously. He transformed this new agent into a force. Purity is not what science is made of. Behind the force, the wings of angels are still invisibly flapping. We are never alone in carrying out a course of an action. And a fact is not a historical. To end... We don't have to start from scratch, but we can use what we already have. Process three was brainstorming and implementation, which is entwined with all phases. It was important to establish direct approach to eel and use what if strategy, my previous work, sustainability of materials, artistic elements and participatory element of audience. Here you can see a brainstorming map. Process 4 was process of implementation the advices from the jury, which was important to stay on track. In my original proposal, jury said that, uh, original, that protocol was original 
and that there was an interesting explanation and connection to Latour's actor network theory, nice analogy between metamorphosis between human and eel. Telepathy and Sufism were problematic. As well, there was challenging idea that we know or what we know about eel. Advice was to try to match the protocol as closely as possible to Latour's views, which I tried. The final process of co-creation and complementation I will share here with you. I will share two minutes out of 11 in total of audio meditation. What you see here is the image of the accompanying sculpture. What is missing is still the audience feedback. Here on the little white paper you can see but you cannot read the feedback I received from our coordinator Christiane Bosman. I imagine that the network between you and me is a dynamic sea of realms where we both lose any relation to me and you concepts. I imagine that you share with me what you want and what you deserve. Are you happy? I imagine I do understand you. I imagine that every person who is listening our story now share their own and try to communicate with you. Please be patient with us, dear eel, or not. And now, dear listener, I imagine that the simplest way to try this communication with eel is to follow a few basic steps. Imagine that nothing is unknown to imagination. Imagine yourself being in a calm and safe presence of eel. Imagine that you communicate in verbal and nonverbal ways. Imagine asking a question. Are you happy? How may I serve? How old are you? Would you like to share anything with me? Imagine a question. Imagine receiving an answer. And imagine giving thanks to eel. Then imagine writing something about it on a small piece of paper and attach it to the sculpture. Thank you, dear eel. Thank you, dear human. Thank you, imagination. To conclude this presentation, I will quote Bruno Latour and say, quote, it is up to us to change our ways of changing. Thank you from the voice for the EEL team, EEL, imagination and Divana. Thank, thank you so much, Ivana, for this uh, wonderful journey throughout the process. Thanks, and, and a bit of the meditation voice. Uh, I'm going to look around through the jury if someone raises his or her hand to ask a question. Maybe Louisa, do you want to say something or ask something? You did not see me raise my hand, but um, <laughs> I will ask a question. Have you also imagined uh, the eel trying to, to take the human perspective, trying to become the human in this? Because we're talking about imagination. How about the eel's imagination? Well, when I started, uh, I tried different roles of um, imagining myself as a eel or imagining Gil as myself, possibly. And finally, uh, it led me to write this letter to Gil. Um, so in the beginning of the letter, here you, you hear only two minutes, but in the beginning of the letter, um, I gave uh, the voice to Gil, like Gil were uh, talking to us or to me. Um, and I think there I, 
more anthropomorphized eel. Um, and I think this perspective is somehow entangled in the letter, not very clearly visible. And uh, somehow through this writing letter, uh, these perspectives get entwined. Um, okay. When I think what would Eel think about us, of course, we cannot say from non-human perspective, it's always influenced but by what we are. Um, and somehow this spiritual notion that I included um, leads me to conclude that, again, we have to be in this together, <laughs> you know? So maybe, maybe it is as it should be, though eels are getting extinct, but there is a certain notion of unknown and um, I, I accept it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hoop, do you want to uh, ask a question? Yeah, thank you very much. I was um, well impressed by um, the structured format you choose in your uh, approach um, and how you apply the concepts of uh, Latour. You started with the notion of, of symmetry, which is indeed a very crucial concept in the work of Latour. But this symmetry is usually established by all kinds of exchanges, by mediation processes between different well, species in this example. Um, why do you think imagination would be the most fruitful form of mediation between an eel and, and human beings? Aren't you afraid that imagination is too much an anthropocentric category to establish mediation and symmetry? Thank you for your question. Um, so again, uh, I would say that imagination opens up many channels. And as I said, it jumps across all uncertainties and questions so we can imagine. Of course, again, we cannot escape who we are, but it allows me to imagine a utopian version maybe. I work also with utopia utopian version or versions of this relationship. And then re regarding mediation, um, I am not, as I said, I'm not a philosopher, uh, but I use uh, in my work, I use Bruno Latour's philosophy. Uh, but um, if we think of parliament of things, I would think also how we could mediate this relationship with eel without mediators, without human mediators. And here I imagine myself becoming, again, you could feel it or sense it in the letter, becoming some sort of eel human or human eel, you know. Uh, so uh, becoming a mediator, but also becoming that other. Again, imagination is a beautiful and powerful tool. And I, I know that scientists uh, use it as well in order to come to very practical ideas. Uh, so it's a starting point. And as an artist, uh, it, uh, for me, it is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if uh, other members of the jury want to ask a question, please raise your hand. I can't see you, so you have to speak out, Peter Paul or Anton, because you're not in my. Yeah, I think you can't see us. Indeed, we were waving, but uh, Tone is waving longer. Has been waving longer than I. So, <laughs> don't you go first? I think. <laughs> I, I I have I have a very short a very short question. You mentioned Sufism in your presentation, but uh, I, I, then I think about. Uh, particular theology, but also about these uh, Darvishes turning around their axis. Um, how did you make a connection between Sufism and Eels? Well, I, it was initially uh, uh, implemented in my proposal, but I moved away from it. At least consciously I moved away. Subconsciously, I'm not sure. 
again, I would like to know what uh, what is how the whole philosophy is created in Latour's mind. You know, I would like to find tracks of uh, of uh, of these other um, philosophies, but I didn't go that far or didn't have time yet. So Sufism was left alone. Um, but I implemented the spiritual notion um, that I usually implement as a holistic approach to, to art. Uh, when you now, I would just imagine again how Sufism can be uh, uh, visible. Uh, you saw these two images of human life cycle. So now I could say, you know, it's a cycle. We for both species have a certain cycle. So now it's very uh, maybe um, uh, like quick uh, answer, but uh, it was not uh, initially implemented. Uh, now in the end, it was not implemented as part of Latour's philosophy. Thank you. Thank you. And then Peter Paul, you have you have questions? Well, if there's still time. Uh... Okay, it, so it actually builds a lot on the first questions and the question about anthropocentrism. So you you, you opened with this comparison uh, between the human uh, life cycle, as it were, and, uh, and well, the, 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 the eel development. And I was wondering, can your work also show us how the eel is, is different than humans? Yeah? So as a way to stimulate our imagination beyond what we are ourselves, and therefore also to give a voice to the eel in, in our imagination? Uh, yes, I could do that, but that's, uh, that's actually, that uh, cycle uh, is visible on the sculpture in a way that I wrote these different stages of life cycle and human cycle on the sculpture, and I connected it just with drawing the dots. So uh, it, is not, it is not said which cycle is human and which uh, cycle is ill, but eventually it can be, of course, visible and uh, detected. Uh, what is different? It could be another, another uh, work, uh, but it's interesting that uh, as soon as we are born, the most majority of us, um, we are female or male, where with uh, eel is not uh, as such. So um, they, I think it's about, um, what is different, but I think between 12, uh, and 20 years, they change their, um, they become female or male when they start their uh, migratory journey. So that is the first, let's say, um, uh, difference that I imagine. But I was sincerely, I didn't know anything about eel. I just knew people ate them, which I haven't and I don't. Um, but this <laughs> fact that they live such a long life and that they have such stamina, that was very fascinating, you know, so I was, I wanted to be actually much more alike, <laughs> you know, finding these connections about this fascinating uh, being, I didn't know anything. Yeah, wonderful. Very, wonderful example, yeah. uh, maybe even how the eel has something to tell us in a very sensitive yeah. topical discussion about uh, non-binary persons, etc. So exactly. It's, it's an interesting example, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivana. Um, Thank you. With this uh, route through your imagination, we are uh, concluding the first round of three pitches, I think. So uh, we have a short break now. And Harpo will tell us when we come back and what we will do at that time, Harpo. Yes. Thank you, members of the jury. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, for your presentation and also for the phrase imagine that nothing is impossible in imagination or nothing is unknown to imagination <laughs> that is you. a very liberating thought in a way um so we have a lunch break at, at the at this moment until 12 40 um so everybody can shut off their microphones and be back at 12 40. Uh, the members of the jury are asked to stay around because they will deliberate for the coming 10 minutes. So um, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, really um, inspiring. 
Um, so the jury is going to be talking about it and we'll see you back at 12.40. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are still waiting for a few jury members to uh, be at their post, but we'll start shortly with the sound pitches. Yes, so we are complete again. Um, so we will continue with two teams pitching their um, underwater noise proposal. Um, so we're going to the case of underwater noise, which is something that is being researched only quite recently. And the question of noise pollution in the North Sea. Um, so I suppose all the jury members are ready and Jorn Baan Hofman will now start his pitch. So Jorn, are you also ready to answer the questions after your video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, you guys can, uh, can start. Nice, thank you. Let's start the video then. What has become painfully aware these days due to the corona crisis is that we live in a world that is shaped by not only the agency of humans but also by non-humans and a very important area that houses many of these humans and non-human agents is the North Sea. I'm Jorn van Hofman and together with my friend Mart uh, Martijn de Vries we came up with an idea on how we could represent the humans and the non-humans in the North Sea. Over the years, the sea has become more busy due to, um, well, us, humans. So for instance, behind me, over there, you might be able to see the harbor of Rotterdam, which is very important for a lot of uh, ships, which sail on the sea. Over there is a drilling platform for oil, and maybe that further in the North Sea you have the Brent oil fields. Um, and now with the climate transition, or at least the energy transition, there are also plans to build, uh, to use the North Sea for electric energy and windmills. However, this increase in uh, activity also brings a lot of noise. Not only we humans, but also other organisms in the North Sea make use of sound. So sound in the North Sea also affects the ability of fishes and mammals, such as seals and purposes and other cetaceans, uh, to communicate and to navigate in the North Sea. So the North Sea is, you could say, it's an arena which contains many different agents which continuously um, yeah, renegotiate how they relate to each other and um, how they affect each other. And the work of Bruno Latour makes us think, how can we represent these agents, agents with whom we share um, an area such as the North Sea? And how can we reflect on how we relate to them? And what we thought is, well, let's just try and do this. Let's just do this by making an, an agent-based model. And an agent-based model, it's as the, the hint is in the name, it is a model which allows us to um, simulate the behavior of different agents. And when you have multiple agents, how would they behave and what kind of emergent behavior uh, can we see? So this is a screenshot of the model which we have. And it's a heat map of sea traffic in the North Sea. So we added ships to this model. And then in a later stage, we also added um, fish. Fishes, so uh, fishes which are affected by noise, which we just called fish, and fishes which aren't affected by noise, which for simplicity we call the prey fish. So they're the prey of the fishes which are affected by noise. And what we wanted to show in this model is um, how these three different agents relate to each other. And if you model their behavior over time, so the fishes, in order to survive, they need to eat prey fishes, so in this graph you see it, as the fishes increase because they multiply, um, the amount of prey fishes, they, they reduce, but at the same time, um, the fishes, they uh, are repelled by noise. So what we saw over time is that um, <laughs> the prey fishes, they accumulated on spots where there was a lot of noise, and are um, the other fishes kind of hovered around it in an ambush waiting for the, yeah, for prey fishes to become available. And when we observe uh, behaviors such as this over time, we can reflect, wait, but 
what in our model, what in how we represented the fishes and the boats and the prey made for this outcome. And we can reflect on it and we notice some, some mistakes we made in our mo model, some wrong assumptions we did on how they, how they breed, how they hunt. And then in uh, future times, you can adapt that. So for instance, <laughs> we made in this model, um, we made the, prey, the, the fishes um, reproduce too much. So at one point it went super exponential and the model couldn't run any further. And because we saw this, we became aware, hey, we made some wrong assumptions. And these become very apparent with a model like this. And also more layers can be added to the model. So over here we added um, some gray spots. And those gray spots are actual, actual uh, planned windmill parts. So the, plan the places where they plan to build uh, windmills. And it can, these can also be added into the model, meaning that um, what if these spots also produce noise? And how would they affect the behavior of the prey and of the fishes? Where would they group and where, what would they avoid? And this model, it's not an actual description of reality, but it can help us think on what assumptions do we make and how can we um, better describe the um, actions and activity of the agents in the North Sea. We think our model is a useful tool. And when discussing with stakeholders such as fisheries, you can use it so they can understand how they affect the habitat and how important the representation of non-humans is. Same for policymakers or the scientific community who can add layers of complexity and make from the model, instead of a more qualitative model, a more quantitative model. Or you can use it for education for high school children so they understand uh, what the relations are within a habitat such as the North Sea and how humans and non-humans interact and influence each other. So taking this together, we think it's a very useful tool for the ambassador of the North Sea to have um, for their further activities. So an Asian-based model, uh, it won't be the answer to the question, how can we represent non-humans in the North Sea? But we do think that it is a very important piece of the puzzle and that it can help us to reflect on how we represent them and what is important when we represent them. That's the appeal of uh, Martijn and I to you of the people of the jury to so take this into consideration and uh, yeah, let the, an agent-based model of the North Sea be part of the solution and uh, help us to represent all the agents in this puddle of water. Thanks. Uh, maybe it's also good to mention, but a model is very corona-proof. Because for instance, uh, what Bruno Latour did in uh, Facing Gaia, or at least what he mentions also in that book, with uh, making the Parliament of Things where he makes students represent uh, different non-humans and then lets them negotiate. I don't think that's something that works very well on one and a half meter distance. However, a thing such as a model uh, can help. And also it can, uh, yeah, it might be easier to implement um, because a lot of people, well, a lot of people, some people might find it easier to click on a couple of buttons on the computer instead of uh, acting around, although acting around is also a lot of fun. So. Thank you. Thank you, Jorn, for this wonderful presentation of your model. Uh, and I want to ask the members of the jury if they have any questions on this uh, agent-based model. Peter Paul. Yes. Thank you so much. Very, very interesting. Very nice. So uh, it really um, made me think a lot of Latour's idea of the politics of nature, in which there basically is this double representation, as uh, you could say. Huh? The people, the humans have to be represented in politics, but also nature has to be represented somehow. And I, I was wondering to what extent your model also enables us to, um, well, um, take into account the concerns of uh, people regarding the North Sea, but also the concerns of the other in inhabitants. So for instance, could human behavior as a result of, uh, well, giving more rights to, to other agents in the North Sea be modeled as well, or a smaller role of humans, a smaller role of fishing and boats and uh, oil drilling uh, when we want to give more room to the fish. So 
is that possible to model it from the perspective of, of the non-humans as well? Um, that's, that's a little bit tricky because if you want to model it from the perspective of non-humans, well, you need to be aware like what their perspective is, and that's really difficult to, <laughs> to yeah. have that level of empathy to not only place yourself in another person, but also another fish or uh, being. But in a model, you can take things like that into, into account. So for instance, uh, we put a couple of sliders in it. So what if the fishes are more affected by noise or what if they are less affected by noise? And then you can do some analysis. So um, I'm going to look over a certain time period and the fishes, uh, I'm going to model two scenarios, one where fishes are really sensitive, one where they are not so sensitive, oh, yeah. one where boats make a lot of noise, one where they don't make a lot of noise. Or the same with the windmills and um, see how much noise they make. Um, so yeah, that's the answer to your question. Alex. But could it then also, has a, as a result that it gives input on how, how we should change our behavior, uh, yeah. our ways of dealing with the sea? Yeah, uh, I think so. Because um, if you maybe reflect, OK, um, for instance, we observe something, too many purposes are stranded on our shores. How can we avoid that? What do we need to do? Um, and a model like this, it won't give an answer, but it will help us to, OK, is it effective if I would uh, reduce the noise of ships? Well, it's not very effective. And if I would reduce the noise of windmills, oh, that's very effective. So okay. in that way, it can show and it can help us to, to steer that. Or maybe um, another thing, just many things you can add those layers into the model um, to model different scenarios so you can know what kind of actions are more favorable to take. Cool. Thanks. We can't hear you, Dan. You have to unmute. You are still muted somehow. Yeah. We see a red microphone. Hmm. Ah, yes. now it looks better. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Louise, you have a question and then yes. Tom, short one, and then we'll have to switch to the other candidate. Louise. Okay, uh, bravo for how you started this film. It was really imaginative and very good start that you take the viewer with you on your path to the sea. I was slightly disappointed when you stopped at the sea side. <laughs> Have you considered just going on underwater and then really, um, I don't know how, but let us experience what you really uh, here. And another question I have in your model, you have three actons and um, I miss the human, the screaming swimmers or the onlookers. And have you considered that to have the humans also as such in the picture? Um, yeah, in, in this occasion, the humans are kind of represented by the ships because we steer the ships and we decide where they go and where they don't go. So yeah. we made it quite limited. But um, as you mentioned, you can add extra actors to the to the model. So, for instance, uh, noise on beaches, and then maybe see a summer scenario and a winter scenario. But then a thing to take into account is uh, the scale of the map which we currently have, and then think how significant is um, yeah. How can I best represent I don't know all the screaming children who are playing in the North Sea somewhere in July. Um, which is a really difficult question. And maybe then we need to zoom in on a map, make a smaller map, a beach version. Um, so that all depends what you want to show. Um, but this is a very versatile tool and it can help with that. I hope that answers your, your question. Okay. Yes, it does. No, the other question, why didn't you go on? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have a very waterproof phone and I heard the water, it's quite cold, but I plan to swim one of these days, I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the, the main reasons. Okay. Well, send us the after movie. Uh, Tone, uh, last question for you. Very shortly, I understand that some species are protected by noise and others uh, flee away from noise. And I suppose that some species are protected by some forms of noise, maybe a steady noise and not the screaming of children in the sea. But this makes it, uh, let's say, it's more difficult to, to think about the politics of nature, if that is true, or, or, or don't you think so? Can you maybe repeat the, the final bit of your question? 
um, does it mean that, for instance, you could you could imagine that uh, politics of nature would mean that we make less noise, but that's not uh, not really the, the result of what you're uh, of what you're uh, suggesting, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. In, in the model at the moment it doesn't suggest uh, a lot. It's like a like a small showcase to show the possibilities what we can do with it. So, for instance, also the distinction I made by representing humans by ships. Yeah, I have one type of ships, but there are a lot of ships in the North Sea, or there are a lot of prey fishes or a lot of fishes which are affected by noise. And the prey fishes I, I have and the other fish, yeah, um, they're kind of like artificial fish. Uh, they don't have the exact characteristics of a halibut or a cod or a turquoise. Um, so to answer your question, that would like require further development of such a model. Um, I hope that answers uh, it um, a bit. But what are the implications? For the, the implications of the, the same model. question as Peter Paul. Uh, what what are the implications for the politics of nature? Uh, for the politics of nature, nature, uh, I think it can help us to um, some ideas we have about. Uh, who these other agents are and how they behave, we can model it and see, does it make sense? And then if we see like, okay, hey, um, I made an assumption. So in the model, I made the assumption, okay, I have fish which are affected by noise and which aren't affected by noise. And the ones which are affected by noise prey on the ones which are not. So for instance, the dolphins, the cetaceans, they have a different way of hearing. So they are more sensitive to the sound of the boats. Well, a cod hears in a different way. So it's less sensitive to the boat. And then I observed something and was like, okay, is this correct? Maybe it is, maybe it's, it's not. Very likely that it's not. And then it made me aware, okay, I'm representing them in a wrong way. And a model is very easy and versatile and you can share it with a lot of people. And therefore a lot of people can play around with it and therefore become aware of how they perceive and represent um, those agents in the North Sea. Thank you. Thank you, Jorn, for your explanation and your presentation. Uh, please uh, watch the second contester in um, this round of uh, sound and voice. Um, and Harpo will introduce. Yes, uh, thank you, Jorn, for showing how uh, noise is part of the ecology of the North Sea. Um, we'll watch the second pitch. This is a really big team by Jos Pijkerman, Marieke Druiven, Ren de Jong, Hielke van den Berg, Marina Sulima, Jesse Riemersma, Le Florida Visser, Hugo Heinen en Jesse Havinga. Speaker for the deaf. Um, let's play the video. De dood van Tubus, beter bekend als de kathedraal, betekent het einde van een tijdperk. Als een van de meest imposante exemplaren van het tube blaasjeskruid, Utricularia tubus, stond de kathedraal vanaf zijn ontdekking in 2045 symbool voor het veranderende akoestisch klimaat in de Noordzee. Menig visje, garnaaltje en krabbetje raakte vrijwillig opgesloten in de lange tubuli van tubus. Naar binnen gedreven door het lawaai, vonden deze arme zielen in de krochten van Tubus lichaam een stil plekje, dat hij ze met alle liefde bood, al voor ze langzaam maar zeker levend te verteren. Het was tijdens de zeldzame periodes waarin de Noordwestsector stil viel, zoals bijvoorbeeld tijdens de containerblokkade in 2053, dat Tubus zijn bijnaam verdiende. Het was een stel sportduikers dat voor de eerste keer op het orgelconcert van Tubus werd getrakteerd. De trage, Heldere noten waren op sommige plekken zelfs aan de kust te horen. De opnames van dit originele concert, opgenomen door monitoringsapparatuur, hebben inmiddels cultstatus bereikt. Nu, ruim 30 jaar later, is het nog steeds niet helemaal duidelijk wat Tubus inspireerde. Het leven van de kathedraal was wonderlijk ambigu. Onderdak voor, maar ook roofdier van de kabaalvluchtelingen van de Noordzee. Oase van stilte, maar ook een luidruchtig componist. Het antroposenisch evolutionair niche dat het tube blaasjeskruid wist te vullen, is inmiddels door menselijk ingrijpen goeddeels verdwenen. De luidruchtige containerschepen en grootschalige bouwprojecten zijn verleden tijd. Windturbines zijn vele malen stiller geworden. 
Het is dus evenzeer met een ambigu gevoel dat wij afscheid nemen van Tubus. Hij laat, voor zover bekend, geen soortgenoten na. Een lijkreden, voor mensen, door mensen, gaat over belangrijke levensgebeurtenissen. Over wat iemand heeft aangericht en wie diegene heeft aangeraakt. Maar hoe vaak spelen geluiden daarbij een rol van betekenis? En hoe anders zou dat zijn voor het leven in de Noordzee? Vanaf het begin gedrenkt in het niet aflatende gezoem van de zee, ondergedompeld in een medium waarin de trillingen van berichten en signalen vele malen verder reiken dan in de lucht boven de golven. Spreker voor de doof is een eerbetoon aan alle Noordzeese wezens en hun geluidsverhalen. Hun leven in geluid. We vertellen de verhalen van vijf unieke exemplaren uit de familie van de oester, de garnaal, de aal, de anemoon en het tubeblaasjeskruid. Het is niet alleen een eerbetoon. Het is ook een waarschuwing, een vraag en een voorstel. Een waarschuwing voor iedereen die te snel denkt te weten wat er aan de hand is, wat er leeft en wat geluid precies is en doet. Een vraag aan degene die bezig zijn met het in kaart brengen van onderzeegeluid. En een voorstel voor de manier waarop deze vraag gepolitiseerd kan worden. We hebben gekozen voor lijkredens omdat het verhaal van de Noordzee erin kan worden van dood en extinctie. Speculatieve lijkredens nu om ze in de toekomst te voorkomen. Daarnaast zijn lijkredens, of beter lofredens, bij uitstek gebeurtenissen die de significante elementen uit hun leven scheiden van de niet-significante. Een vraag die onder water anders beantwoord zou moeten worden dan op land. Spreken voor de doven bestaat uit beeld, geluid en verhaal. Met kleine sculpturen verbeelden we de gehoorsystemen van de verschillende onderwaterwezens. De oorschelp van de tonijn, die ieder jaar net als een boom een extra ring groeit. De haarcellen van de anemoon, die afscheuren als hij aanvalt, maar gelukkig snel weer aangroeien. Ieder beeld wordt vervolgens dezelfde soundscape gevoerd. Gemaakt uit geluiden die in en rond de Noordzee voorkomen, maar vertalen deze op een andere manier. De bezoeker is hier getuige van. Hier voelt hij de soundscape, daar ziet hij het. Bij weer een ander beeld bij de bezoeker zijn of haar tanden op een stuk metaal, dat het geluid in de schedel afspeelt. Zo wordt duidelijk dat onderwatergeluid geen homogene ervaring is, maar de bron van een uiteenlopende verzameling ervaringen. Wat wordt er precies bedoeld met de ervaring van onderwatergeluid? Het woordje de verraadt dat iets hier wellicht te snel geunificeerd wordt, wat eigenlijk meervoudig is, zoals de Nederlandse filosoof ethnograaf Annemarie Mol dat zou noemen. Immers, als Harpo het hart van de ambassade ons vertelt dat verschillende diersoorten verschillend gedrag vertonen bij gelijke decibelniveaus en frequentiespectrums, is het dan niet overduidelijk dat we met twee verschillende, maar deels samenhangende geluiden te maken hebben? Wij vragen ons af of onderwatergeluid, gereduceerd tot geluidsmetingen, niet de radicale andersheid van ervaringen in de Noordzee verhult. Hoe brengen we die andersheid dan wel in kaart? Dat doe je door je niet enkel te richten op hoe je onderwatergeluid het beste representeert, met welke instrumenten je die het beste vangt, maar ook door te kijken naar wat je representeert als je het over onderwatergeluid hebt. Door je kortom te richten op de gevolgen van onderwatergeluid. We maken dan de bekende salto van de actornetwerktheorie. Kijk niet naar wat een actor is, maar kijk naar wat een actor doet. Waar de hoe-vraag een centripetale beweging in gang zet, waarin een steeds selectere groep experts te spreken komt over onderwatergeluid, vormt de wat-vraag een centrifugale beweging, die steeds meer betrokkenen in de kwestie betrekt, die vraagt om interdisciplinariteit en nieuwsgierigheid. Spreken voor de doof is dan op te vatten als een waarschuwing voor een te nauwe opvatting van het parlement der dingen. Als Peter Balverbeek zegt dat een goede afweging gebaseerd is op de stemmen van alle betrokkenen, dan klinkt het misschien alsof we zonder problemen de burgerij van de Noordzee kunnen aanwijzen. De les van Latour zou dan beperkt blijven tot de realisatie dat deze burgerij niet slechts uit mensen bestaat. Maar de rest blijft ongewijzigd. We pakken de oude politieke theorieën bij en tuigen een parlement op waar nu ook plek is voor niet-mensen. En als we maar goed genoeg nadenken over de vorm van het parlement, jassen we daarna onproblematisch alle problemen er doorheen. In een nauwe opvatting van het parlement de dingen brengen we de dingen, kortom, naar de politiek. Maar er is nog iets anders wat Latour ons kan leren. Spreken voor de doven vraagt aandacht voor die andere kant van Latours werk, waarin het politieke naar de dingen wordt gebracht en waarin matters of fact matters of concern worden. Tussen verschillende definities van onderwatergeluid zit overlap, maar ook frictie. 
Ze nodigen uit dat bepaald beleid en sluiten de ogen voor andere oplossingen. En de vraag welke verbeelding van onderwatergeluid de hoofdrol krijgt, is daardoor niet een neutrale vraag die aan het parlement vooraf gaat, maar juist de inzet van politiek conflict. We moeten de politiek daarom naar de dingen brengen. Niet één parlement der dingen, maar ontelbare dingparlementen. Dank je wel. Dank je wel voor deze fantastische presentatie. Uh, het ligt voor de hand om Peter Paul van Beek als eerste het woord te geven, omdat hij hier uh, in geciteerd werd. <laughs> Dat doe ik zeer graag. Ik, ik ben er stil van. Uh, ja, er, erg onder de indruk. Heel erg mooi gedaan. Um, en he, helemaal eens uh, met wat jullie uh, uh, zeggen ook. Uh, ik denk dat mijn belangrijkste vraag zou zijn, um, je noemt het een spreker voor de doven. En uh, dat lijkt natuurlijk ook een uh, soort aanklacht. Hè? Namelijk dat wij mensen de, de doven zijn, terwijl jullie alle gehoorzintuigen uh, laten zien van, van, van allerlei niet-mensen. Dus op, op welke manier uh, proberen jullie hier die, die doofheid van de mensen dan te raken? Dus op, 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 hoe, hoe, hoe heb je gepoogd om juist zeg maar, mensen aan te sporen om hun verantwoordelijkheid te nemen om die stemmen uh, ook te horen van, van de niet-mensen. Ja, um, ben ik goed te verstaan? Ja. Oké, okay, mooi. Um, uh, nou, het, het probleem wat we natuurlijk hebben... Kijk, ik zeg niet dat we, um, dat we doof zijn voor uh, niet-mensen. Ik bedoel, die, die komen genoeg aan bod. En dat is ook een meting, is in, in, in een zekere zin een gesprek met niet-mensen. Um, dus dat we doof zijn, dat is niet helemaal waar. Wat wel een groot probleem is, is dat denk ik op land... Um, als je op een mensen voet gaat staan, dan schreeuwt hij wel. Um, maar wat die voeten zijn van niet mensen en of ze gaan schreeuwen, dat is dan wat moeilijker. Uh, sta je bij een mens op de voet, dan uh, zoekt hij misschien andere mensen op die ook uh, op de voet zijn gestapt. Die beginnen een clubje, uh, lichten wat journalisten in. Ze, ze, ze brengen een publiek tot stand, een nieuw publiek, dat, dat een probleem heeft ge, gevonden wat ze allemaal aangaat. Uh, can I come in? There's somebody who asks, can we do it in English? Because obviously not everybody can understand this. So oh, yeah, sure. I can, I can try, yeah, of course. Sorry. Uh, so I was saying that, yeah, uh, on land, humans have the ability to very quickly form a public, uh, a, a, a new uh, group that will address a problem that, 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 that uh, they all struggle with. And underwater, especially because the underwater sounds are so new, those, those non-human publics are, are not as easily formed and they take a, they take a longer while. There's not that much, uh, there's not that much inst institutions to help with creating these underwater sound noise publics. Um, so I think what we're trying to do is, is, is what Isabel Stengers would call to slow down reason. To, to, you, you mentioned taking into account in the last uh, question, um, to, to call attention to that taking into account, to not, to not shortcut it, as the two would say. Thank you for your, thank you for your answer. Um, I, I'll give uh, one short uh, question or the opportunity for a question to Huub Dijsselbloem, and then we have to move along already. Well, thank you very much. It's not easy to uh, come up with one short question in this uh, in this case. Uh, I think it was a beautiful presentation, um, dramatic, uh, but also playful and imaginative and conceptually, conceptually very, very rich. Um, what I really enjoyed was that you took the point of the variety of experience seriously. It's a crucial thing, I think, in the work of, of Latour to argue that experience is not just a subjective feeling, but a shared something that connects humans and non-humans and all kinds of entities. So that calls for a variety of an approach that represents the variety of these experiences. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? What kind of varieties can you distinguish? What kind of possible uh, publics of underwater species? What forms of loyalty between 
mm. the community between these species do we uh, can we see arising when we do justice to this variety of experiences yeah um well you say community of communities between species do you also mean non-human and human both yes okay well for instance i, I think in the north sea and also in the Wadensee, the, the wooden sea uh, there's been a trend towards uh, um, especially in fishing the boats got bigger and smaller fishermen are are, um, are uh, warded off um, before the summer me and yesa uh, we went to see one of these shrimp fishers. He was one uh, of the few, I think there's 15 independent shrimp fishes left. And he told us about how the shrimp fishing goes. Just the amount of, of feeling and know-how and interaction with these animals, um, there is, that's amazing. And I think, for example, if we're talking about creating non-human publics, the, these, these relationships between non-humans and, and fishermen, for example, are very important because they are our first way to uh, become sensitive to these, these small changes in, in, in such an ecosystem. We do something here in the form of maybe building windmills and these fishermen will be the first to tell us something changed with the shrimp. Um, so yeah, I think those, those yeah, and you could say the, 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 the fishermen are in a sense are native people. They are the ones closest to nature and the ones we, we are looking towards now also in, in helping us and in, in, in being uh, these uh, full split them, uh, what you call them. I don't know. <laughs> That's why I want to do it in, in Dutch. But uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> it does, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your uh, speaker of the deaf uh, pitch. I think we have a short break now. Harpo, and at what time do we come back? Uh, yes, thank you, Jury. Thank you, Chesse and the whole team. Thank you. Um, thank you for the notion of not just a parliament of things, but multiple thing parliaments. Mm -hmm. um, That's free. <laughs> we'll take it to the bank. Um, so we'll have a short break. The jury will uh, deliberate. And at, um, uh, so at 13.25, Five. We'll see you all back. So I'll uh, send the jury to their deliberation room and you can just hang around till 13.25. See you all soon. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are going to the three presentations for the case, the future of the Delta. Are all the jury members ready? Here we are still waiting uh, on for Huub, but he will be here any minute. So we will continue with the three pitches for the teams, for the future of the Delta. And the question at hand is, what to do with the delta works when the sea level rises and who are the actors to be represented in this case um so the first team to present is uh maarten meijer eileen stornebrink willy vogel dennis hamer and charlotte van meijenveld which the uh, the pitch is called Oosterschelde in onderhandeling. Um, is your spokesperson ready for the questions afterwards? Yes, I am. Great, thank you. So let's start the video, please. Bewoners van Zeeland en omringende Nederlanden. Wij worden door Gaia opgeroepen om onze geliefde Oosterschelde te redden. Middels stijgende zeeën en dalende gronden maakt Gaia ons duidelijk dat onze woonplaats in haar huidige staat niet voor altijd en voor iedereen bewoonbaar zal zijn. Hoe houden we de Oosterschelde een gedeeld huis voor mens, dier en plant? Breken we haar open? Timmeren we haar dicht? Of geven we een geheel nieuw landschap vorm? Om deze vragen te beantwoorden moeten we luisteren, vertegenwoordigen en onderhandelen. Luisterend leren wij onze plek in Oosterschelde kennen. 
Vertegenwoordigend vinden wij bondgenoten. Samen met hen onderhandelen wij om samen het landschap leefbaar te houden voor visser en zeehond, voor worm en aardappelplant, voor stedeling, boer en trekvogel. Welkom in het parlement van de Oosterschel. Mijn naam is Maarten Meijer en ik ben jullie gids voor vandaag. Namens mijn vier collega's leid ik jullie rond tijdens deze buitengewone Zoom-sessie van het nieuwe parlement. Het parlement is een plek waar bovenbouwklassen van middelbare scholen in Zeeland de inwoners van de Oosterschelde vertegenwoordigen en zich samen buigen over de toekomst van het landschap in opdracht van Gaia. Het betreft hier niet alleen de menselijke inwoners van de Oosterschelde die worden vertegenwoordigd, maar ook de niet-menselijke actoren die de regio haar thuis hebben gemaakt. Ik zal jullie door de regels en procedures lopen, waarna we een kort stukje van het parlement in sessie observeren. Kort gezegd bestaat een parlementaire sessie uit drie fasen. Luisteren, vertegenwoordigen en onderhandelen. In de luisterfase worden scholieren gekoppeld aan een van de politieke actoren die deelnemen aan het politieke spel. Dit vindt plaats middels een digitale vragenlijst. Neem bijvoorbeeld Anne die vandaag met haar klas de zetels in het parlement gaat bezetten. Omdat ze zichzelf thuis voelt in het water en liever niet al te diep over de vragen des levens stopt, wordt ze gekoppeld aan de mossel. Ze krijgt daarmee dit kaartje. Hierop staat informatie en een geinig gedichtje, hetgeen Anne inspiratie geeft voor hoe ze haar belangen als mossel zo goed mogelijk kan vervullen. Nadat alle deelnemers zijn gekoppeld aan een rol, komen we tot de tweede fase, waarin de relaties tussen alle politieke actoren in kaart worden gebracht. Dit is de fase van het vertegenwoordigen. Hier maken parlementariërs verbindingen, middels draden, met de politieke actoren waar ze van afhankelijk zijn. Dit doen ze op basis van redenatie, inlevingsvermogen en met behulp van de informatie die op hun kaartje staat. In dit stadium maken zij ook kennis met een aantal nieuwe actoren, zogenoemde spelactoren. Zoutwater, zoetwater, zandbanken, stad, windpark, waterkering, duinen en akkers, die gezamenlijk de elementen van de Oosterschelde op het speelveld vertegenwoordigen. Anne bijvoorbeeld is als mossel afhankelijk van de zandbanken en het plankton dat zij graag eet. Vervolgens merkt zij dat er ook een aantal actoren van haar afhankelijk zijn, bijvoorbeeld de mosselvisser die leeft van de mosselvangst en de cultuur daaromtrent. Hierdoor ontstaat er uiteindelijk een complex afhankelijkheidsnetwerk. In de derde fase, de onderhandelingsfase, buigen de parlementariërs zich over collectieve vraagstukken betreffende de toekomst van de Oosterschelde. Dit doen zij met in de ene hand hun specifieke politieke actor en met in de andere hand de afhankelijkheidsnetwerken waar ze zich in bevinden. Laten we eens een kijkje nemen naar een debatsessie over het zandvraagstuk. De stelling luidt, er is steeds minder zand beschikbaar en er moet een keuze gemaakt worden. Wordt deze hoeveelheid zand ingezet om de kust te verdedigen of om nieuwe zandbanken te maken? Als zeehond lijkt het mij duidelijk dat het behouden van het unieke en fragiele ecosysteem van de Oosterschelde belangrijk is. Hierin spelen de zandbanken een grote rol. Waar anders moet ik liggen zonnebaden? Als zeegras sluit ik mij aan bij de opmerking van de zeehonddelegatie. Bovendien wil ik benadrukken dat het een het ander ook niet uitsluit... Door mij de ruimte te geven om in de buurt van de zandbanken te groeien, help ik mee met het beschermen van de kust. Als het parlement niet kiest voor kustbescherming, kiezen ze voor mijn vertrek als aardappel uit de Oosterschelde. Als het grondwater te veel verzilt, zal ik niet langer in de akkers kunnen groeien. Zonder aardappel geen boer, zonder boer geen voedsel, zonder voedsel geen samenleving, zonder samenleving geen zandopspuiting en natuurbescherming. Het lijkt me wel duidelijk dat jullie allemaal van mij afhankelijk zijn. En dat we dus moeten kiezen voor kustbescherming. Maar boer, wat is die mensensamenleving in de Oosterschelde zonder haar relaties met mij, de mossel? Zonder mij verliest de cultuur van de Oosterschelde haar ziel. Maar zelfs met de hulp van de mosseldelegatie blijken de verwoede pogingen van de Zandbankcoalitie niet in staat om het tijd te keren. De meerderheid van de stemmen gaat uit naar kustbescherming. En als consequentie verliest een groot aantal spelers fiches. Deze fiches vertegenwoordigen de populatie van een actor. In het uiterste geval betekent het verliezen van alle fiches het verdwijnen van de actor uit de regio. In dit geval veroorzaakt het verdwijnen van de zandbank ook het verdwijnen van de zeehond uit de Oosterschelde. En worden de draadjes waarin zij is verbonden doorgeknipt. Gaia roept ons alle op om plaats te nemen aan de onderhandelingstafel. Samen met de menselijke en niet-menselijke actoren waar wij op een tal van wijze mee verbonden zijn worden we gevraagd om een gemeenschappelijke aardse wereld te componeren. Het Oosterschelde parlement is een klein onderdeel van dit proces. 
Een proces dat berust op een aantal filosofische bewegingen uit het werk van Bruno Latour. Allereerst veronderstelt het parlement een herdefiniering van politiek in de moderne maatschappij. Waar voorheen nagenoeg alleen mensen en menselijke belangen worden vertegenwoordigd in politieke arena's, worden in het Oosterschelde parlement menselijke en niet-menselijke stemmen op gelijke voet behandeld. We bewegen ons dus weg van antropocentristische politiek. Hiernaast vindt een tweede herdefinering plaats, waarin politiek niet simpelweg wordt bedreven op basis van belangen die in isolatie worden gedefinieerd. De mens, de vis, de vogel, ze zitten niet alleen als entiteit aan tafel, maar ook als knooppunt van een verscheidenheid aan relaties. Geen actor kan overleven in pure isolatie. En daarom is het identificeren en beschermen van afhankelijkheidsrelaties van vitaal belang. Hiermee komen we aan het eind van deze rondleiding. Vandaag de dag zitten we hier op Zoom voor een buitengewone sessie van dit parlement. Maar normaal heeft het parlement eigenlijk twee vormen. Allereerst een mobiele vorm in bordspelformaat. Waarbij we het parlement naar het klaslokaal brengen en deze omtoveren tot een parlementaire setting. En middels deze elementen. Hiernaast werken we aan een vaste vorm in de Oosterschelde bij het Watersnoodsmuseum. Deze laatste setting brengt de urgentie van de problematiek duidelijker naar voren. Tevens zullen de sessies in het vaste parlement ook in de buitenlucht plaatsvinden. Hierdoor worden spelers direct blootgesteld aan de elementen en het landschap. En is de omgeving nog duidelijker en voelbaarder vertegenwoordigd in het politieke spel. Voor nu danken wij u voor uw aandacht. Hierbij is de buitengewone sessie van het parlement van de Oosterschelde beëindigd. Dank u zeer voor deze... Oh, we will continue in English. Sorry. Uh, thank you for this presentation of this uh, wonderful game. Uh, I'll ask um, the jury members uh, to have some questions. Peter Paul. Unmute myself first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, amazing. Really, really well done. Uh, the game and also the installation. So I've basically one question. So in the third stage of the game, uh, there's a negotiation going on. And I was wondering how you... Uh, uh, intended to set up that negotiation because it it it, it could i mean it, it feels a bit like there's only power play and it's about who is going to win and whose interests are going to be stronger and another way of dealing with it would be more organizing from deliberation as it were in which you try to do justice to, to all the interests and to to keep the system as a whole system uh, alive so can you say a bit more about how the negotiation stage uh, will be organized. Thank you for your kind words. Um, uh, I think you're right. Uh, of course, in Latour, there's a, a strong Hobbesian uh, 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 orientation, especially in his earlier work. But we try to mitigate that a little bit by emphasizing that that um, the importance of relations uh, and and the sort of coalitions that emerge through these relations and a web of of uh vital attachments let's say that all these actors individually are are participating in are connected to um through that network we try to mitigate that sort of conflictual hobbesian uh, uh mode of of, of engaging in, in political uh, deliberation and um highlight maybe possibilities for collaboration and finding alternative solutions to to uh, uh, these kind of problems You're mute, Dan. Oh. Louise, wil jij, uh, wil jij een vraag stellen? Yeah. Uh, I should do it in English, I suppose. Please. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. The target group of your game is children. Um, to me, that gave the impression as if we adults are explaining something to children who don't know yet, who have to be um, uh, be made aware of a problem. Um, have you also considered of taking as a target group adults because we simply also don't know and uh, maybe that would have uh, changed the kind of debate one could have. I forgot to say in advance perfectly made really well made so bravo for that so my only question is the target group why children 
Um, thank you for your uh, for your compliments. Um, we had uh, long discussions about the target group, and of course, uh, should our uh, design be part of the uh, exhibition in Nemo, then of course it will be uh, available to play for, for visitors, no matter what age. Um, but we thought that um, children from the age group of 16 to 18 uh, might be particularly interested in, in these kinds of uh, questions because of course it concerns the, the future of their landscape. Um, and, 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 and so far from us trying to tell them what to think or, or, or uh, uh, sort of engage in a, in a sort of a pedagogical exercise, which would be very contrary to uh, uh, the philosophy and the spirit of Latour, we actually wanted to activate uh, um, students to, to think about, well, these kinds of questions, questions of the future of their landscape and then the political politics, also the non-human politics involved um, on their own terms. And so that's sort of the, what the game is trying to do. Far from pedagogy, it's more of a mode of activation and, and uh, getting them into action. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your answers and for your presentation. I'm afraid we have to go on to the next pitch because we, are, we have two to go. Uh, thank you so far. And uh, we will invite the next group of students, I think, Harp. Yes. Um, thank you, jury members. Thank you, Martin, also for bringing the very important element of play. Um, so our next uh, pitch that we are going to next pitch is by Ellen Merkes, Sander van der Swan, Maarten Smith, and Jelle Bruinenberg. I suppose you are going to give a uh, PowerPoint. So you're, yeah, you're that's right. right. Mm -hmm. So you are, have, have to. Um, share your screen and uh, keep in mind that you have seven minutes. Yes, you're right. Sander will share his screen uh, right now. Uh, so if you could stop sharing it, then Sander will share it and I'll be doing the presentation. Um, in the meantime, you can find in the chat a link to a Dropbox page. And that is uh, our end product. It's a little booklet. We've done our best to get it to the jury in its physical format. And that's worked for half of them. For the other half, uh, we invite you to click the link and download the digital version. I'm going to do the, do the rest of the presentation in Dutch because the Dutch language is very intimate to our project. Um, so the opdracht van de ambassade was om de Noordzee een stem te geven. Uh, in ons subproject sub gaat het specifiek over het laten meedoen van de natuur in het debat over de toekomst van de delta. Hiermee kom je snel uit op vragen als wat is het belang van de Oosterschelde en hoe kan dat worden meegenomen? Bijvoorbeeld in beleid of in een politiek, politiek debat. Wat hoort, wat ziet, wat voelt de Oosterschelde en wat betekent dat? We vinden het gaaf en belangrijk om te laten zien hoe groot de rol van natuurlijke entiteiten is in onze dagelijkse praktijken. Om dit te doen hebben we wel een iets andere benadering gekozen dan was voorgesteld. In plaats van de natuur een stem te geven hebben we juist geprobeerd om de mens te ontstemmen, om onszelf te ontstemmen. Niet de natuur vermenselijken, maar de menselijke praktijk juist naturaliseren. In dit project kijken we specifiek naar de toekomst van de delta. We hebben daarom onder andere te maken met de Oosterschelde, de deltawerken, de zeeuwen en de meeuwen. We zijn dus niet gaan zoeken naar een manier om de Oosterschelde en de meeuwen aan een besluitvormingstafel te krijgen, maar hoe wij, hoe wij de mensen die aan die tafel uh, zitten, op een nieuwe manier laten, kunnen laten verhouden aan natuur, aan die, die natuurlijke entiteiten. Met ons diverse team, bestaande uit twee designers werkend aan de TUW, een filosoof werkend bij Macquarie University en een bestuurskundige van de gemeente Amsterdam, zijn we met deze vraag aan de slag gegaan. Waar onze probleemstelling en antwoord behoeft dat bestuurskundige verandering kan bieden, hebben we de openeindigheid van een ontwerpproces te harte genomen en is ons onze output voornamelijk talig en filosofisch. Er zijn een paar sleutelmomenten uit het proces en die ga ik benoemen. 
Uh, sleutelcomponent 1 is uh, het vertrekpunt van Active Network Theory. Vrijwel in het begin van de ontwerpwedstrijd werd ons team gegrepen door het idee dat entiteiten elkaar vormen in een relatie. We willen begrijpen hoe entiteiten elkaar over tijd vormgeven, met elkaar verstrengeld raken. Een mooi voorbeeld is een spin dat zich vormt naar de vlieg en een net of een web uh, maakt om een vlieg te vangen en een vlieg die evenals die ook eigenlijk zich vormt naar de spin. Een onderscheid hier gaat over de prioriteit van de relatie en de relata. Gaan voorgegeven entiteiten al dan niet een relatie met elkaar aan? Of worden de entiteiten zelf gevormd in de relatie? Dit sluit aan bij Tim Ingold's kritiek op Active Network Theory. Zijn voorstel is om het netwerk door de tijd heen te zien. Hoe actoren in wederzijdse correspondentie gevormd worden. Wat een punt was in, de, in het Active Network verandert in een lijn die zich over de tijd heen ontwikkelt in relatie met andere actoren. Een manier van dit verschil begrijpen is een verschil in sensitiviteit. Wat trekt je aandacht als je dit doorhebt? Met een correspondentielens ga je letten op hoe actoren wederzijds gevormd worden over tijd. In sleutelmoment 2, dat is dat we met een camera naar de Oosterschelde gingen. Als ontwerpers begrijpen we dat technologie onze relatie met de wereld medieert en dus ook dat technologie herarrangeert wat relevant voor ons is. Met een camera in de hand ga je op zoek naar iets wat je wil belichten, wat je wil delen, wat je wil tentoonstellen of aandacht aan geven. Nou, met dat idee hebben we met een middelformaat camera in de hand een bezoek gebracht aan de Oosterschelde. Met de half gevormde ideeën over correspondentie, een camera in de hand en de presentatie, deze presentatie op de horizon, hebben we gepoogd om die wederzijdse vorming van relaties over tijd in de Oosterschelde te belichten. Sleutelmoment 3 is het vinden van Odysseus op Schouwen Duivenland in een tweedehands boek, in een tweedehands boekenzaak. En Jelle vond dit boek en daarin wordt een theorie gespind over hoe de Odyssee zich eigenlijk afspeelde op Schouwen Duivenland. De theorie is niet echt heel geloofwaardig, maar het vermitiseren van Schouwen Duivenland gaf ons wel een totaal nieuw beeld op hoe we ons zouden kunnen verhouden tot het landschap. Odysseus bevindt zich te midden van een goddelijk krachtenspel waarin hij zich staande probeert te houden. Het originele verhaal is geschreven in het Oud-Grieks en er wordt gebruik gemaakt van een middle voice of medium in het Nederlands. Om het midden van ik doe en er gebeurt te beschrijven. Deze vorm bestaat niet in onze grammatica. Dus in feite raakt correspondentie ondergesneeuwd in onze eigen taal. Dan hebben we sleutelmoment 4 en dat is een gesprek bij Frituur de Helling. Waar je trouwens de beste kibbeling van Nederland kan krijgen. Tijdens ons bezoek naar de Oosterschelde zijn we gestopt bij Frituur de Helling voor een portie kibbeling. We hebben toen een gesprek gevoerd over wat zo'n middle voice zou kunnen betekenen in ons, in ons dagelijks leven. We vroegen ons af, zijn er alledaagse praktijken waarin de correspondentie tussen mens en natuur duidelijk zichtbaar is? Sander probeerde onder woorden te brengen hoe hij met de golf omgaat in het surfen. En een reflectie hiervan staat in de zien. Het hele proces komt ook samen in de zien. Hierin hebben we de gemaakte foto's gecombineerd met ons talige onderzoek. We hebben gepoogd om onderschriften te maken die de correspondentie tussen de entiteiten op de foto's vatten. Nou, met deze achtergrondinformatie willen we jullie graag de tijd geven om ons rustig door de zien te bladeren. En nodigen we jullie graag uit om hier met ons in gesprek over te gaan. Uh, zoals je kan zien zijn de foto's ook beschikbaar om groot gedrukt te worden, want het is met een heel grote resolutie genomen. En dus als jullie dat leuk hebben, vinden, dan kunnen we dat natuurlijk heel, willen we dat heel graag delen. Thank you for your presentation. We will continue in English for, uh, on behalf of other participants. I have the zine here with me. It's the printed one. Very, very beautiful. Um, are there any members of the jury who wanted to add something, ask a question, give a compliment? made a comment, please. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, beautiful. Uh, a true odyssey, so to say, um, through this beautiful landscape. Um, and I think you were right in addressing us in, in Dutch because you are very playful with words. For instance, the very the manifold meanings of the words correspondent, correspondence, and uh, it being in correspondence with each other all resonate really well in your uh, presentation. 
So that was a joy to, to see. Well, my, my main question is actually when you talk about actor networks and, 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 and politics, also the previous presentation clarified that it's not only about symmetry, harmony and correspondence, but also about frictions and, and tensions. Uh, what kind of role do they have in, in this journey? And when does a tension, for instance, become violent? Which tensions are allowed and which tensions should be excluded from these corresponding networks? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Can, can we answer the questions uh, together, by the way, or is it like one person? Sure. I think the, the, the idea of bad co correspondence is not that we like go around the, the, like the frictions and everything, because that's exactly what the correspondence is. We form each other in this relation, basically. Um, and I don't think we really went into what kind of uh, frictions are actually bad or wrong. It's more that by highlighting that we form each other in this correspondence, um, we make our own, our own like intentionality a bit less important in this uh, in this correspondence. So I think that's that's the point. Thank you for your answer. Are there other members of the jury who want to speak out? Tone. You are muted. Yeah. There is an ambiguity in uh, also in the preceding presentation, but also in this one. Correspondence, um, also to set up a conversation. All this seems to suggest something like reciprocity, and reciprocity means that the 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 entities, let's say, that uh, correspond, they are more or less on the same level. Of course, you could say yes, but isn't the really the real uh, situation one rather of dependence, uh, possibly in some cases mutual dependence, sometimes also asymmetry? And uh, shouldn't we take into account in this kind of uh, conversations and also in the, the very interesting uh, quest for a middle voice? Shouldn't we take into consideration also this? possibility of asymmetry and dependence. Can I give this one a try? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure how we agreed which one will, uh, will answer. Uh, I think in the in the zine you find one picture of the Zeelandbrug. Uh, and I think that's a, a very nice case of a kind of uh, uh, one level dependence where it's really the, the bridge is there as something fixed and stable and the Oosterschelde flows itself around that bridge. Um, uh, and so in that sense, in, 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 in our photo journey, we try to also figure out the limits of this dependence one way, one direction. And perhaps it's something that is reciprocity is more like an ideal that you can find in some particular kind of cases and that you need to highlight rather than the fact that it's always there. And I think the kind of way of thinking like we're going to make a concrete entity that is not changed by, but is changing the flow of the of the water, and that that that's a really kind of one direction kind of way of thinking. Uh, in the, in the philosophical reasoning, we, we call it kind of the, the prototypical transitive event. The kind of one thing is doing something to the other, and the reciprocity is not really there. So we try to also explore those limitations and different metaphors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is it time for a question, Dan, or should we continue? Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. It's not 2001 A Space Odyssey, but 2020 <laughs> Schouwer Duiveland Odyssey, <laughs> which is very nice. Uh, I was wondering, so you seek to uh, find this middle voice uh, between I do and something happens. It's, it's happening to let our own intentionality sound less loudly, uh, as, as you say. But how could it then also still be something political? So is it a call for uh, less uh, action of human beings or should we change our course of action and so even if our intentionality sounds more loudly there is some form of human intentionality left and where's the political call to what kind of human intentionality who wants to answer this one <laughs> 
yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give it a try. I, th I think the political is something that we that we um, uh, that we wanted to step away from, in a sense, and, and that's political in the sense of the liberation of of equal voices and and, and trying to be to, to be heard. Uh, and I think politics is always done by human actor, actors, and uh, I think the, the project here is to, in a sense, shape the self-understanding and intentionality a little bit of, of, of politicians or people who are acting in a political domain, and in that sense, make a political uh, uh, change. So in that's, that sense, we took a kind of in, in, indirect route towards politics rather than directly putting uh, uh, the Oosterschelde at the table or within a parliament also. I agree with the, with, with the previous discussion where it's, it's not, there's not one parliament thing, uh, but the multiplicity of thing parliaments, I think we really much resonate with that kind of idea. Thank you for your uh, answers and your pitch of this uh, in, correspond in correspondence with uh, the Oosterschelde. Um, I think we have to go to the third presentation in this round uh, and it will be the last for this day. The pitch of uh, team three, Harpo. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, jury. Thank you, team, for giving us for your attempt, the practical attempt of trying to become less human. Um, so we will go to the third, indeed, and last pitch for the future of the Delta and of the day by Nesrin Gunesh, Sylvia Kazaku, Hao Yu Dong, Clarissa Schmidt, and Ying Kai Liu. Um, is your spokesperson ready to answer the questions? Yes, we are ready. Nice, thank you. Uh, let's uh, start the, the video for the pitch Ego Schelde. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hao Yu. Today, I will be presenting our concept on behalf of Team Eco Schelde. Our entire world is created from a human-centered design perspective, which leads to the ecological and economic crisis we are facing today. As an attempt to respond to this, we take the recently established more-than-human design approach, which challenges anthropocentrism and advocates ecocentrism by creating a tool to visualize the contradictory and controversial nature of matters of concern, as Bruno Latour suggested. Although ANT of Bruno Latour sees all actors as equal, many times they aren't. Especially between humans and non-humans, we often see a power imbalance where humans have the upper hand. With our concept, we want humans to experience the opposite perspective of this relationship by looking at human activities through the eyes of the animals. To do this, it's important to recognize the underlying cognitive orientation towards this power imbalance in certain kinds of attitudes and behaviors humans portray. Thus, for the theory we are combining the ANT of Latour with the DMIS model from Bennett. As you can see in this figure, by combining the theory with the model, we, we are able to understand human behavior in relation to non-human actors. The created model helps us to design for the different stages. So going from an anthropocene mindset towards a ecocentrism one. To do this so, we created the game Ecoschelda where humans experience for themselves how it is to be a non-human that is part of nature, meaning not being in control of one's own life and comprehend what is happening to them and why, as humans are changing the environment continuously. By making use of serious gaming, the topic of experiencing a non-human perspective becomes more visual and approachable. The game consists of three actors, and the map of the game is extracted from the region Osterschelde. The players will hear Osterschelde speaking to them, so they have the opportunity to question themselves before and after the game experience. Within the game, time is condensed so that the impact of human actions against the non-human actors can be immediately experienced. As we said enough, we would like to demonstrate one scenario of how the game can be played. I am Oosterschelde, a 
place in Zeeland in the Netherlands. I included humans, animals, living organisms who breed and live together in one place. However, the selfish choices that were made by humans have influenced our whole ecosystem. You, yes you who's listening right now, I'm providing you a chance to look from their perspective. Choose a character, I hope you will survive. The game begins and the animals start their journey. The seals hear loud noises somewhere behind them. They're really painful. It sounds like something is being dull. They should quickly find a way to get away from this. The seals have made a good choice for their next step. They and all other animals feel well and safe in their current spot. The oysters and seals are in a good place. They feel happy on their journey. But something horrible happens to the otters. Some scary, loud and fast machines travel there. And just run over them. Their journey is over here. The oysters ended up in a frightening place. Something big moves along the seafloor and suddenly pulls all of them up and out of the water. Soon, they end up on the plates of hungry tourists. Unfortunately, the seals also chose a bad place to go. Suddenly, many humans and big machines appear. They quickly destroy all of the beautiful area that the seals chose for themselves. The seals cannot escape to a safer place anymore. None of the animals survived. The game is over now. You have seen that I allowed humans to live and build their pots and habitats alongside my waters salt marshes, soil, seals, oysters, and even my otters. After this experience, will you reconsider your human actions? Will you rethink the other organisms living in my ecosystem? I am Oosterschelde, I will go on. However, your actions will determine your fate. I am safe. So to conclude, while we hope to provide an interesting game experience, we consider that the main takeaway from this game is the reflection that follows after. In this sense, we value the critical aspects of the discussion and reflection, which emphasize human behavior and its consequences on the entire ecosystem. As Otis Helda said in the video, However, your actions will determine your fate. I am safe. In the context of Route 2030 of Embassy of North Sea, we imagine that our game could serve as a research tool to virilize different perspectives of other North Sea actors, maybe beyond Osterschelde. It can be organized as a low-budget educational tool with various participants, but also as a immersive experience in museum and gallery settings. Regardless of the possibilities of the venue, gameplays could also be recorded to allow for further analysis of player choices. Thank you for listening. For more information, please check our report. Thank you, Team 3, for the wonderful explanation of your game. Um, now it's time to uh, answer two or three questions. Um, can I pose a question uh, to you in the first place? Because um, you are uh, mentioning uh, at the conclusion uh, this game could serve as a research tool uh, for the Embassy of the North Sea. Do you have thoughts on how you, how you can connect with this game or with your, your proposal to non-human agents? Because um, I see uh, a game played by humans or children or adults, but how do you connect or research the, the non-human perspective? So uh, when you say how you research the non-human perspective from my understanding is like, how do I place myself uh, as them, right? That, that's the, the thing. All right, so uh, when we looked into the network network theory itself, for us, it was stated as this. So the humans, 
are like the upper hand species and everybody else is like underneath. So we wanted them to relate to uh, the other species by putting them literally within their shoes or uh, how we say it in Dutch, right? Uh, you plaats yourself in zijn of haar schoenen. So that's kind of like the feeling that we wanted to create. So by showing them, we are not aware of actually that we are hurting the other species, the other organisms that are within our environment. We wanted to switch and put their goggles on their eyes. And that's kind of like how we create that throughout uh, the, the game, the experience that we have created. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, who wants to have a follow-up question? Peter Paul? Yeah. Thank you for the game. Very nicely done, I think, also in an exciting way, maybe with also with an appeal to a very wide audience uh, because of the, of the showy sounds, etc. I liked it. So I, I, I was wondering um, how you then um, frame the, um, well, the mutual dependence of all the entities there, because somehow it seems to be almost an extinction game, right? So who is going to survive at the expense of who? <laughs> and are there also ways to play the game where we could develop ways of living in harmony somehow? Uh, yeah, yes, this is uh, definitely possible as we try to enhance within the video itself. This is like one scenario that we created to show how the game can be played. So uh, based on uh, what you said, there is a possibility indeed that you can uh, switch it by showing the more harmony side of uh, like us all living in one uh, si similar ecosystem, basically. Um, and if I may up, add up to that, um, in the version that we showed, the main aspect is for humans to really experience this power imbalance uh, that animals or other non-humans currently experience of being completely overpowered by human actions. Um, and that's where we also see this connection to the Route 2030 of the Embassy of the North Sea and really helping them to build empathy amongst other people who might not be really aware uh, or considering how much human activities impact other players. So in the current version, the main point is on building this empathy, but we think that the play is, uh, the game is really adaptable and it can be played in different ways in different environments and with different goals or different kind of messages behind it. Thank you. Thank you. Louisa, you want to pose a question? Uh, yes, I, I was wondering, because your picture, very beautifully made, by the way, and also a very good idea to, to turn it into a game. But if you picture the humans as an external power um, and not as participants in the game, how can you ever address um, the imbalance of power? Uh, I would like to answer that. Um, so what we want to say, uh, there is this thing that we see what we are doing as humans ourselves. We build something, but we are actually not aware of what's happening around us, or we not are thinking not clearly about the other organisms within the environment. So the idea behind like having actually um, human actions already pre-recorded and you playing against them, that should make you aware of like uh, how humans are actually acting currently also right now. So that's the thought that we had and that we could place us humans more in the shoes of the other species to make them feel that empathy more that Clarissa was also uh, talking about. But isn't then um, the outcome of the game too much fixed already in advance? So this whole balance play between several parties is not an open game that could lead anywhere to another, but, but the, there's a given outcome. Yeah, Aren't for you afraid yeah. of that? Because the human power is outside, is that force against which all other parties are, are merely victims and battling against. And so, so I was wondering, um, isn't the outcome too much given? I, I see what you what you're indeed trying to say, and I can relate to that, especially just in the sketch scenario that we have now. But this is like a, a one scene or one scenario that we have. But we could also like change and shape the scenario according to how we want also to portray and tell the story itself. 
So for now, we try to make people feel the empathy. But if we want to, for example, focus on something else, like uh, Peter Paul from Bake was mentioning, like the mutual dependence, then we can write a scenario or the game according to that to make people feel that also. So that's but, kind of like the adaptation. But now there's only this one enemy, which is the human being, uh, whereas all other species are not fighting with each other and not uh, outweighing each other's power balance. And um, so I, I was wondering, yeah. Well, yeah, no, no, I, I, thought, well, I would also like to add something to this, Nesri. Yes. Um, so regarding all these different scenarios, what we also uh, wanted to to uh, do with this game is to show that you could um, change the scenario that you are putting into discussion based on the outcomes that you would like to um, see from the discussion. For example, we say that we would like to, we see this game as a research tool. If the researcher wants to for example, learn what um, what moves and what actions and what different um, things um, participants learn from this game, then of course the researcher could adapt it and try to uh, put the accent towards, uh, let's say, um, other species playing against each other. This was not the outcome that we were envisioning, but that's why we also left it uh, open. Okay. Thank you so much for this extra explanation and for your pitch and presentation. Um, I think we had we take a short break, Harpo. Relatively long break. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you, team. Thank you, jury. Um, we will uh, take a break until quarter to three when the winners will be announced. Um, and the jury is going to deliberation. Um, so uh, please stick around and uh, I'll see you at quarter to three. Yes, welcome back everyone. Um, Dan Rovers, the chair of the jury is going to announce the three winners per case that are going to be featured in the exhibition in November in Nemo here. Um, we are very excited to know who they are. Dan, please. Yes, uh, the jury reached a conclusion. But uh, first of all, I want to thank you all, all participants, because uh, the jury had has enjoyed this day very, very, very much. It was an, a pleasure and a delight to be your jury today. So let, let me thank you all for your creativity and your ambition and your design and your uh, elaboration of the works of Latour. But uh, we had to, uh, uh, to bring out three winners, one per category. And the first one, the first category on the eel, uh, the winner of the design uh, on the eel is what you humans call North, the helmet. And I, I, I will only say one sentence to the winner and you will all receive uh, a, a small report of our comments, uh, also the not winners. And what the jury liked most about uh, what you humans call North is um, the ambition of bringing back one of our lost senses that of the geomagnetic uh, geo sensitivity, uh, as we can learn from the eel. So that was a very um, good motivation for the jury to point you out as a winner. The second one, the second category, that's the one on uh, voices and uh, sound. And the jury reached the conclusion that speaker for the deaf should be the winner of this topic. And well, there were two beautiful presentations, but the, the interdisciplinarity of the project, the multi-layeredness and the voicing of the non-human agents was very, very impressive and well done according to the jury. So that's, that's our second winner for today. And then the third one, 
uh, on the topic of the Oosterschelde. And uh, we have reached the conclusion that uh, the game Oosterschelde in onderhandeling should be the winner of this part of the, uh, of the competition. And we thought that it, was, it applied very well Latour's concepts and it was very closely related to its work and a good ambition to getting children already acquainted to, uh, to connect with the non-human perspective. So that's a very good ambition according to the jury of today. So that's our three winners for, for, this, for this afternoon. Um, this three uh, will, uh, yeah, <laughs> applause, I see. For you all. Good for my moments. Yeah. <laughs> Big hand to you all. Uh, these three uh, will be invited to uh, come to Nemo, but uh, let maybe it's good that Harpo will explain the rest of the process. And also uh, Peter Paul can say a word on the uh, revealing of the winner at 6th of November. Yes, well, first of all, congratulations to the winners, the three winners. And uh, thanks a lot to all the other participants and big thanks to the jury. Um, so these three uh, just have been announced, will take part in the exhibition um, here in Nemo. Um, well, what will happen, we will contact you about how this is going to be uh, Done. So you will you will uh, receive a word from us, um, and then yes, on the sixth of November the final winner will be announced. Um, Peter Paul. Yes, thank you, Harpo. Yes, so uh, of course uh, there are three winners, and I think you should all consider yourself. Uh, a winner. <laughs> but uh, in order to make it even more exciting, we decided to choose one extra winner of these three who will be uh, announced at the, at the conference that we will have at the University of Twente from November 4 to November 7. In the afternoon of November 6, we will do that uh, at uh, a quarter to three. There will be a session where actually the three winners are invited to give a presentation again, uh, a pitch, a video pitch. You could also be there live if COVID allows, let's let's hope it will all uh, stay possible somehow. And then uh, we will announce the winner of these three winners. The, the winner of the winners, it sounds a bit <laughs> neoliberal, <laughs> but, and it's just after the American elections. <laughs> but, but let's hope uh, that we will not experience it like that. It's just uh, everyone is a winner already, but it's exciting to, to, to take it to the next level. So you'll get an invitation for that. And of course, all, all three uh, winners uh, will get access to the conference, which is a digital conference, by the way. So there's much more that you can attend than only this. Yes. Um, so once again, thank you very much. We've reached the end of our, of our program. I had a really, really interesting morning and afternoon. I'm really excited about everything that uh, was was said and what I'm really looking forward to having these three works, these three researches designs in our exhibition. Um, if COVID allows, but let's hope so. Um, yes, just let me end by saying thank you again to all the participants. Thank you to the jury. Thank you to the Stichting Spinoza Lens to the design lab, to TU Twente, to all the ambassadors of all the universities, and then most of all, the students. And well, I'll hope to see you all on the 6th of November and during our exhibition, the 20th to the 27th of December, of November, excuse me. And don't forget the 24th of November to watch the Spinoza Lens award ceremony of Bruno Latour. So thank you very much. Thank you, Harpo. Thank you.